Hello, this is a video in my Lectures on Philosophy series, and this one is on uh, Perspectives on Truth. Now, earlier in this series, I did a video on logic and on logical fallacies, and that relates to this field of philosophy, which we might call epistemology. Um, ancient philosophy had three basic branches, um, ethics, uh, epistemology, and metaphysics. Um, Ethics had to do with ethics, you know, how, what's the good life, how do we, you know, how should we live, that sort of thing. Uh, metaphysics had to do with basic reality, and I will cover uh, metaphysics. I decided to cover it in my um, uh, uh, perspectives on science video. Go figure. But anyway, that's where metaphysics is hiding uh, in this series. I don't emphasize it, obviously. This is the primary video on epistemology. Epistemology can be somewhat abstract. Uh, I've sometimes described it as, sometimes described it as, how do I know that I know what I think I know? Um, and it's a very key idea, and it tends to be very, uh, very deep. Uh, but I'm trying to keep this video somewhat practical. Uh, we will mention Plato and Aristotle. I have Raphael's School of Athens behind me. You can see Plato pointing up and Aristotle pointing down, and um, uh, Socrates is kind of leisurely there on the steps. <laughs> anyway. Let's dive in, epistemology. I want to, instead of being real abstract here, I want to talk with about um, William Perry's stages of intellectual development. Now, I don't completely I agree with, with William Perry's stages, but I think this is very helpful uh, if, if, with, with some Schenkian modifications. Um, so, because as I make this video, it's 2020. It's the end of September 2020. Now, I don't know what the outcome of the election is going to be in a little over a month, uh, but um, uh, President Trump is up for re-election, and it is going to be interesting, to say the least. And I, I actually know people who are stockpiling weapons, expecting some kind of a civil war even, um, which seems really unnecessary to me. But part of the problem right now is um, we, we don't know how to think, in my opinion. People don't know how to, how to think. People think they know how to think. Uh, and of course, this has to apply to me too. I just, the problem is we don't know where we don't know. Um, but I, I'd like to think that I'm a little bit more objective than a whole lot of people. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. You know, maybe, you know, all this time I thought that they were the crazy ones and it turns out it's me. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just go through these stages and I think this is the purpose of an uh, education. Actually, this is the purpose of a liberal arts education. Liberal arts uh, doesn't get a lot of uh, praise these days. And I understand because most people find it irrelevant. And I, I personally do think that the liberal arts could be taught in a way that it is at least uh, seen to be more relevant. I've tried to do that in some of these, uh, some of these videos. But um, really liberal arts, if they do what they're supposed to do, are supposed to help people be able to be good thinkers and good voters, even though they may not agree with each other, hopefully they can, they can think more critically and, and better after having had a liberal arts education. Maybe, maybe that's wishful thinking and I just need to get over it. Uh, but but this, this progress, this pr uh, developmental stages that William per Perry suggested in the 20th century I think is a good, gives good insights into what it looks like to become an educated person. Uh, what, and, and in particular, what, it would, what would it mean for the liberal arts to open, open your mind, to liberate you from ignorance, as, as it were. Um, I know that sounds condescending, but I mean, it, some people have knowledge and some people don't. Um, that's just, I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't like that I've fallen off this cliff. I don't believe in the ground, Splat. Anyway, you're going to go splat anyway, whether you believe in the ground or not. Okay, there is such a thing as truth. I do believe in truth. Okay, so we start off maybe, I think a lot of people, most people start off with what we might call unitary thinking. I'm going to call this pre-modern thinking a little bit later, but actually I prefer unitary to pre-modern for reasons I'll tell you in a second. But a unitary thinker doesn't even know there is another option. Have you ever found this where you just, you just assume this is the way it is. 
uh, and you, it never even occurred to you that there might be another way of doing it. And then someone comes along and shows you another way and you immediately are like, why didn't I think of that? Of course, there's another way to do this. That's not usually our reaction. Actually, usually our reaction is like, that's not true. You're an evil person, smack. <laughs> um, when, we, when our blind spots are exposed, usually most people get defensive, I would say. Um, but but um, this is, of course, true if, if everybody you've ever been around is of a particular political party. And so obviously the other party is evil, whatever it may be. Um, believe it or not, not every Republican is evil and not every Democrat is evil. I don't know what you think, but, but there are actually some good Democrats and some good Republicans. It's true, believe it or not. Um, and so unitary thinking uh, um, is, well, you, you never even have even thought of another, another option. You know, have you ever thought about having your cat for supper? Well, of course not. That's just crazy. And again, for those of you who watched several of my videos, I, I'm not against cats, really. Cats can be nice sometimes. Okay, but unitary thinking is where a lot of us start off. We don't even know that there are other options. Well, then sometimes we find out, oh, I found out that those people over there think differently. Well, they're wrong. They're evil. They're going to hell, and I'm going to shoot them. So this is a kind of binary uh, thinking. Uh, where, uh, I mean, think of the, the, the uh, genocide in Rwanda, you know, between the Hutu and the Tutsi, you know, obviously the, everybody who's the other side is evil. And, you know, uh, it, can, it can be white and black and white, literally sometimes, where you have uh, some of these protests that ha after dark have devolved into, uh, not the same, I assume it's different people. It's like um, the, the, the peaceful protesters uh, check out, well, had a good day, didn't we, Ralph? You know, and then the, the violent people come and kill each other. But anyway, um, uh, there is a tendency to be binary in your thinking when, you're, when it's pointed out to you, well, those people over there don't actually see it the way you do. Well, they must be evil. They must, those evil liberals or those evil fascists or whatever you, you want to say. But that's binary thinking. And there are black and white situations. I'm not saying, it, Perry might have said, well, there are no black and white situations. I'm not sure. I think he probably leaned to say that there weren't any. I do think there probably are some black and white situations. You know, Hitler, you know, let's, let's just say he's bad. He's a bad guy. Um, you know, well, you're looking at the bad side. I mean, what are the good points of Hitler? I mean, he brushed his teeth every morning. Actually, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he had bad breath. That's not really important. But, but usually, binary thinking is an oversimplification. Usually a us them kind of thinking probably isn't right. Um, although them's fighting words, you know, if give an inch, they'll take a mile. I, I post a, so uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Tim Keller. He's a pastor in New York city. Uh, and this is a very divisive time and it's all over, you know, the Facebook wars. Um, and uh, Keller posted something that basically we shouldn't say uh, that the other side is, uh, well, he didn't post it quite this strongly, but you, you shouldn't say the other side's evil um, on an issue unless you can show a clear biblical, you know, ver X marks the spot. The Bible is very clear here that this is wrong. Um, but there's a lot of interpretations of scripture. And he mentioned poverty. He mentioned uh, abortion as, and he mentioned uh, immigration as three issues where um, Christians may agree on the goal, uh, but have disagreements over how to get to the goal, that sort of thing. Man, I, sh I shared that on my Facebook page, and there was a little bit of war, not, not as bad as some of the wars. I've, I've managed to kind of different, differentiate who sees what sometimes, uh, or they blocked me maybe, or uh, ignored me. Um, but uh, there was, you know, a little bit of contention over that, you know, how dare he say that you can't take sides? Well, of course you can take sides. I mean, that's, that's binary thinking, and it usually, in my opinion, reflects a lack of nuance uh, in one's understanding. Um, things usually aren't this or that, and it's completely, absolutely clear. Um, I think this is, this is a problem for some people. Uh, it was a problem for me uh, because things were presented as uh, black and white, that kind of unraveled in my mind. Now, I'm not saying that I'm, you know, the smartest man in the world, or I'm certainly not the smartest woman in the world, but, but um, there, are, there are things that they just, they just unravel. It's like um, it was presented to me as it's this or this, 
but my mind would say, well, but wait a minute, um, what if, and, and it just would unravel. And so I just, I think that this is an image, less mature. Binary thinking is a less mature, less insightful, uh, more ignorant uh, perspective uh, than, than some of the later ones on, some, on most issues. So the next stage, and by the way, this isn't exactly the way William Perry put it. This is my modification, as I said. Next would be spectrum thinking. This is where maybe you're, you're aware that there are multiple possibilities uh, on a particular uh, issue. Actually, before I uh, stepped into my office here, uh, here in Athens, um, I, I was reading a Facebook post uh, where um, a former student of mine said, um, Do, can you even define what a socialism is? And there was a bunch of people that uh, jumped all over. I noticed this was six days ago that she posted it. Um, and so I saw her last post was something like, I'm sorry I asked, you know, so something like that. And of course, since I can't, I have no um, discipline, um, uh, I went ahead and I posted um, that I actually think there's quite a spectrum between, say, hyper-capitalism and hyper-socialism. I said this in my uh, economic video, uh, which immediately precedes this on, on the list, um, that you have the kind of hyper uh, socialism that was true under the USSR, the Soviet Union, uh, before the wall fell, um, that where the state controlled everything, controlled the, the, the goods, the means of production, the workers, the distribution of, of goods and, and, and finances and such. That's an ex one end of the extreme. Now, on the other end of extreme, you have a kind of completely unbridled capitalism uh, that um, was the case probably in the late eight, 1800s where things were really not very good. I, I, at least I argue that in, in my video. So you've got these kind of uh, opposite ends of the spectrum, but there's all kinds of in-betweens, right? There's all kinds of stages uh, in between, um, including, so like uh, universal health care. Um, you know, you don't say, oh, we're going to become like the Soviet Union because we have universal health care. Well, no, I mean, it's somewhere on the spectrum. Um, I mean, we have, we have um, a police, right? The police aren't privatized. I personally think that there are a lot of things that should not be privatized. Um, I, uh, privatization uh, is oriented around profit. It's oriented around money. Um, it's not oriented around service. Um, and so um, there, there's a spectrum here. Even on the issue of abortion, um, it's, it's interesting because I, I almost never, and I almost never, Hear the, hear the issue posed in terms of somewhere in the middle. It's, it, the way it's presented is either you, either you believe that we, we cannot uh, interfere with uh, life once uh, the egg is fertilized. I'm, I'm wording it that way. Um, the, e either there is a moral responsibility to protect the life of a fertilized egg, or you believe that if the head's sticking out, you can still abort it. You know, there is a huge range in, in between there of, of positions. In fact, Roe v. Wade, um, I, I, I'm not sure that many people even know what Roe v. Wade said. Roe v. Wade basically said, and I'm sure I'm simplifying it, I'm not a legal expert, but from what I understand, Roe v. Wade said that um, the first trimester is, you can't, you can't, pass any laws uh, in the first 22 weeks, I think is the original, I think we're down to 20 weeks, but, but basically you cannot pass any laws that prohibit uh, a woman getting abortion in that, that first 20 weeks of her pregnancy. Now, uh, then uh, Roe v. Wade said in the second trimester, um, some laws can be passed, um, uh, but, uh, but generally if the life of the mother is in danger and, and so forth. And uh, Roe v. Wade, I think, said you can't, you just can't abort a baby that's in the third uh, trimester. It might have said unless the life of the mother's in, in, in danger. So, so really, Roe v. Wade was really only targeting the first trimester. It wasn't that Roe v. Wade didn't give a free for all uh, for the second and third trimester uh, of a pregnancy. And so, you you could have all kinds of positions uh, of somebody who would say, well. When uh, and I'm not I don't know anybody who takes these positions, but in theory you could have somebody who would say uh, you can't abort a child uh, once it has a nervous system and can feel pain. 
you know, or you, you can't abort a child once its lungs are working. I mean, you could, you could have all kinds of, of, of gradations in between. And yet this, this is presented as a binary kind of issue in any circles that I've ever been in. Maybe I don't get out much, but so, so a lot of issues that are presented as binary may actually have kind of multiple uh, possible positions along a spectrum. Now, problematization uh, is the idea of where I finally recognize that my position is not perfect. Now, I, I, I kind of don't like William Perry uh, at this point because I think, there, couldn't there be the perfect position? I think, I think I have the perfect position on what the square root of four is. It's two. Um, you, you know what I mean? Um, so uh, he's probably right. I just don't like stating it, oh, at some point you're gonna realize the problems with your own position. Uh, everybody will. That, that may be true. I, I just, I don't like to say that. <laughs> um, but I suspect that he is uh, more correct than not, and maybe totally correct, that most of the time we come to a point where we realize that my position isn't quite as foolproof as I may have thought it was. Um, and this is a troubling thing. Uh, this has happened to me a number of times uh, when I was in seminary, for example, um, and where I, I kind of got this feeling in my gut where I thought, you know, I'm probably wrong on this issue. And of course, these were issues of interpretation of the Bible. Uh, they were issues of various things. It was very troubling to me. Some people think I'm a rabble rouser. Um, I don't know. I don't perceive myself as a rabble rouser. I just like to share all the things that I've thought. <laughs> I'm a talker. I'm not a, tr I'm not a troublemaker. Um, but anyway, um, William Perry said at some point, you're going to problematize uh, your position and realize, you know, I may not have it all down. I get worried sometimes as a Wesleyan when I read Romans 9. Romans 9, of course, is uh, talking a little bit about predest predestination. And although I put up a good face, um, I do get worried sometimes when I read Romans 9. I get kind of a chill goes through me when I read it. Now, of course, there are plenty of Wesleyan passages and Arminian passages. So don't think you've got me just because I admitted that sometimes I flinch. Um, you know, I'm right. But, but you know, I, I recognize that, that there are passages that could be read differently uh, than the way uh, I read them. And I get this kind of sinking feeling in my gut. I don't like it. Anyway, let's move on quickly. Um, Humility, wouldn't that be nice? I'm, I'm working on it, I'm not there yet. But um, so once we begin to see, well, you know, I may be wrong on some, some of these things, then, then hopefully we reach a kind of epistemological humility. Um, now the problem is when people are really stupid, you know, then it's like, okay, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be humble with the other intellectuals, but you're just plumb dumb. I'm sorry, I just couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I could have helped myself. It's a lie, it's a problematic position. Anyway, humility um, is hopefully uh, a step somewhere in here when you, you realize, you know what, I don't have all the answers. And it is often said, actually this goes back to Socrates. I, I don't know whether I've actually talked about Socrates. I should do a history of philosophy appendix uh, to a series of videos as an appendix to these lectures on the topics. But anyway, Socrates um, uh, you know, basically said in his um, apology, that you know, when the, when the Delphic Oracle told him he was the smartest man, he didn't believe it. Um, but then he started asking people questions and realized I am smarter than them because I know that I I don't know. Uh, now I'm not sure if I believe Socrates, but but there is a sense in which the more you know, the less you know, and there's a sense in which um, the, the more you know about your own position, the more you know that it's problematic. Let's let's face it; it's much easier to tear down other people's positions than it is to build up a a positive case for a particular uh, position. Um, this is not where I mean Perry, Perry kinds of kind of ends up with a with a, a complete pluralism. You know, you have your ideas, I have mine. You know, let's all have be friends. Um, I I don't I'm not I haven't given up yet. I haven't given up on truth. Um, I, I, I get punched every once in a while with people who say, come on, Ken, admit it. Uh, you don't know any more than anybody else. Um, and I don't know any more than anybody else. Let's go have a drink. Actually, nobody's ever said that to me. But um, uh, 
I do, I do still believe that there can be better and worse constructions of truth. Um, and, and so I'm going to call the final stage here integration, where integration is where you've pulled all the knowledge that you have. You've reached a certain kind of self-awareness to where, okay, you know the problems of your own position. You're humble about it. Um, but you, you can see some of the, the truth in other people's positions. And at least you've reached a point of personal integration where, as far as you know, you've integrated together all the things you know with the things that you don't know. And you've reached a kind of homeostasis, you know, with that, that kind of point. Well, um, do with it what you want. That's my version of William Perry's stages of intellectual development. And of course, I think we need to get beyond binary thinking in our political conversation and begin to realize that uh, there, there are probably some truths on both the Republican and the Democratic uh, side, probably. Um, so, well, let's move on. So I've already kind of expressed all this, um, but um, I, I have slides on them too. So unitary thinking, what is unitary thinking? This is where we're unreflective. We don't even know what we don't know. Um, Plato's myth of the cave, I'm sure I've talked about uh, previously uh, in this series. If not, uh, uh, he tells this in his Republic. Uh, and um, in the Republic, basically, there's some people who are chained to a wall and they see shadows, but they don't know that they're shadows because that's all they've ever seen. One of them gets free, goes to the cave entrance, oh, the light, the light, you know, but begins to see, oh, I wasn't actually seeing the real things at all. I was only, only seeing shadows of the real things here outside. He goes back, tries to convince his old friends uh, that he has um, actually seen outside um, and he's seen the reality and they kill him. Um, and of course, some, some might suggest that this is a parable of Socrates himself, who was put to death um, by the city of Athens. Um, but uh, for Plato, of course, it is, it is this idea that we move toward the realm of ideas to contemplate the reality uh, of ideas and not just look at the shadows of material things that are uh, around us. But um, so this idea of reaching enlightenment, finding the light, these sorts of things um, is a parable for moving out of unitary thinking uh, to see more accurately, not to see things in a shadowy way, uh, but in a, a substantial uh, kind of way. The problem is, of course, we don't know that we're wearing glasses. Um, and so we don't, we don't know what we don't know. We just assume that our way is the only way. We start every issue as a unitary thinker and then are surprised, well, I don't know that this is always the case, but, but then we're surprised when we encounter that there are actually people who think differently. And our first reaction is to think they're weird, uh, but maybe they're not weird. Maybe they just see things uh, in, a, in a different, maybe even a better way. Here are just some, some examples. I've already talked about eating cat. That seems to be a theme somewhere in my mind. I've never eaten cat no knowingly. Um, race, uh, the assumption of white, uh, white supremacy um, uh, without knowing um, what it's like for other races. Polygamy, um, again, it's an assumption in some places. Uh, uh, in Africa, there, polygamy is still practiced in some places. Uh, the idea that the sun is the center of the universe. These are all assumptions. Sometimes you'll say, well, everybody knows. And usually when, uh, my experience is, is that when you say everybody knows, you don't have an argument. You, you actually can't, it's like, what? I don't know how to answer that. Well, everybody knows that, um, that you, 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 you want the drawers on your dresser to be closed. You don't want them partially open with clothing kind of, everybody knows that. Why? But why? But why? This is why two-year-olds are so kind of annoying because they don't they don't know our pre-reflective assumptions yet. We haven't drilled them into them. Okay, so we move toward reflectivity. So we might call this pre-modernism, although you notice I didn't call it pre-modern because pre-modern sounds like, and then um, when Descartes came along, everybody became reflective, which is not true. We're, we're all to some extent pre-reflective. So pre-reflective um, good on you, Ken, whenever you made this PowerPoint. Pre-reflective is much better than, than pre-modern. Um, toward reflectivity, we might call this modernism. Uh, modernist thinking. Uh, uh, modernist thinking emphasizes objectivity. Uh, modernist thinking uh, uh, emphasizes rationality. Now, um, this kind of objectivity has come under a lot of, uh, a lot of um, heat uh, in the last 20, 30 years. Postmodernism, of course, says 
you're not objective. And of course we are, we're not, nobody is objective. And uh, I've been reading some uh, philosophy um, by uh, black thinkers. Um, and I, I, I deeply apologize that um, I'm only at the beginning of my, um, uh, my knowledge of uh, the philosophies of people of color. That's a major fault uh, of this series. I, I am deeply apologetic that I um, have not uh, uh, advanced greatly in that area, but, but I do know that a lot of uh, current black thinkers would consider this quest for objectivity um, to be a somewhat white culture uh, kind of quest. Um, and so I, I have to wrestle with that um, because um, the scientific method is sometimes as a, as a way of thinking um, considered to be a kind of white culture uh, characteristic. Um, I struggle with that characterization a little bit uh, because I have a laptop. Um, and so I would not in any way want to align uh, science or the scientific method with, with a particular race. That, that strikes me as a... As a uh, fraught with all kinds of, of perils. But I will say very clearly that I do not believe that anybody can be objective. I do think, however, that objectivity is a good goal. I do not align it with any race or ethnicity, um, although, I, again, th there is that critique out there. I, I consider it to be the best quest uh, for, uh, that, that, that the best benefits um, will, will come to humanity um, if we aim at objectivity, even though we can't be objective, that we aim at it and we try to be objective, including trying to be objective about matters of, of race, which may involve a self-critique. Anyway, reflective knowing uh, thinks it's reflective. Think Spock in uh, the original Star Trek. Now, um, the Spock in the reboot is a little bit, I think, more emotional than the original Spock. And of course, Spock got emotion of some, a little bit of emotion um, in both one, one episode, but also in, um, uh, in the, the first movie series. But Spock basically was a logical guy. You know, he made, a, he, he made his decisions purely based on logic and not based uh, allegedly. But Spock doesn't exist, right? Nobody, there is no Spock. Rene Descartes is usually where we, um, uh, where we, mark the beginning of modernism. Um, Rene Descartes uh, basically said, I'm gonna question everything I can question until I can't question anything else. Um, and in the end, uh, he said, well, you know what? I am questioning, I think, therefore I am. And that was the one thing that he thought, well, I can't doubt that um, because I'm thinking I know I exist. Now, I don't completely agree with him. I think um, thought exists. What is an I? We don't know what a I, not this I, but an, what is an I? What is a me? Um, so uh, Descartes was not quite as reflective, I think, as he might have been on that. But Descartes basically um, created what we call an epistemological turn uh, that that um, let that turned thought from I'm just assuming without knowing that stuff is out there and that I'm seeing it as it is to a kind of um, questioning of ourselves as knowers. Um, um, how do I know that I know what I think I know? What is the certainty of knowledge? Usually Rene Descartes is, is the point at which we talk about the birth of modernism, at least in philosophy. Um, so in modernism, I strive to, to have an objective point of view, one that I can't ever get, but I try. Um, and I use two main tools to get there, my reason and my experience. And um, the, those approaches in philosophy that favor reason as the path tend to be called rationalist or rationalism. And those that tend to consider experience the path um, are called empiricist or, or empiricism. Um, by the way, I might add here that my knowledge of the Bible does not bypass my reason and experience. This is a kind of, an, an, again, a an, uh, unitary thinking where people say, well, I just do what the Bible tells me. I, I was talking to some, someone years ago about, the, about um, the Wesleyan tradition that I'm part of. And I said, well, the Wesleyans think uh, this, and then the Baptists think this. Um, and the person stopped me and said, stop saying the Wesleyans. We just, do what the, we just read the Bible and do what it says. Well, that's unitary thinking. In my opinion, this, or 
this person didn't even realize that there were other ways to read the Bible. The Bible doesn't come, you know, kind of uh, in my hard drive. It has to be inputted. And how do I input it? I read it and think, you know, my thought. Even in Lectio Divina, there's thought going, going on. And so the Bible is an object of knowledge. The Bible is interpreted as I read it. Um, and I interpret it with a whole lot of my experiential baggage um, coming to bear. So the Bible is not just a third, it's not a third source of truth, because it has to come into, it has to be inputted through reason and experience. So we're, we're right back where we started. Okay, rationalism, in a little bit more detail, I've already, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, I should have reviewed my uh, my script, um, but Descartes, as I said, is sometimes called the father of modern philosophy because of this quest for absolute certainty. And I already mentioned, I think, therefore I am. Empiricism, usually John Locke is considered to be the father of modern empiricism, although Aristotle was an empiricist in his own, his own right. Uh, John Locke, father of modern empiricism, he talked about us having a kind of blank slate, a tabula rasa, a blank. We have this blank slate inside. And um, um, what happens is, this is what he argued for, that um, we go through life and we, you know, oh, cup, water, yummy. And so we input stuff, input, input, input. But Locke really did not realize the fact that we, we don't just put it, our experiences into our head without interpretation. We have this mind software we as as we will see in a second we have this software that input that interprets our experiences we have preconceived categories of of for example space and time um and um our our brain is like a green screen onto which we put our experiences um a hollow deck for you star trek next generation people or matrix people um so but he said we have a blank slate that we write we write stuff onto, um, and of course, uh, again I've read a little bit of um, uh, um, Ibram Xendi, uh, stamp from the beginning, and he 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 really takes Locke to task. Now again I may be wrong I I'm not sure that I found I I value Xendi's work definitely, um, but I'm I'm not sure that I would be as hard on Locke as he is I'm not sure. For example, that the blank slate here is is a white board. Um, maybe maybe it was in maybe maybe Locke did make that. You might say, well, of course you're going to say that, Ken, because you're white, and and that may be true. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna contest um, because I I'm not sure. I'm 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 an unreflective knower on on myself on some of those things. But anyway, um, Locke was the empiricist, and of course David Hume followed him. Uh, and took Locke to his logical conclusion. He took empiricism to its logical conclusion, conclusion and said, well, cause and effect. I can't experience the law of cause and effect. I can experience that if if I let go of this book and it hits me on my head, that that hurt. So I can experience each moment. You know, I can experience it here, 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 here. I can experience it here. I can experience pain. But what I can experience is the glue the logical glue that puts all those things together and says law of cause and effect. Same thing with, with facts and values. So um, uh, if somebody comes up to me and punches me in the face um, and I say, hey, you shouldn't do that. They might say, why? Um, I mean, both of us might agree that the person punched me, but to, to get from the fact that a person punched me and I had pain, which, you know, is that the cause effect? Um, to it's wrong for you to punch me. That's, that's a, there's a gap there between facts and values. And so um, David Hume basically said, all of these things fall apart uh, if it's purely empiricism, because these are things that we don't experience. Uh, there are kind of feelings that we have. Um, so it, yeah, it feels bad when you punch me, but who am I to say it's wrong for you to punch me? And in fact, Hume believed that ethics was basically about sentiment and emotion and, and so forth. Well, in comes Kant um, at the, uh, in the late 1700s. Kant broke the tie 
uh, between rationalism and empiricism. So rationalism, reasonism, said we, we are objective through our uh, reason. And then empiricism says, no, 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 we get to truth through our senses. What Kant said was, is that the content of our knowledge comes through our senses. I'm constantly inputting things through my experiences but that the shape of my knowledge, the organization of my knowledge came through reason. This just seems to make sense to me. Um, and I, I often sometimes uh, uh, make the analogy of, of software. Um, uh, so for example, um, I, in, I type things on my computer all the time. Like look at this PowerPoint that I made. Isn't it a lovely PowerPoint? You know, I inputted this PowerPoint, but the shape that this PowerPoint has taken, there weren't an infinite number of options. PowerPoint is a software that, that only will shape input in certain ways. Um, and so there's a cooperation between me and the software. And so for Kant, of course, obviously there are no computers in 1800, but for Kant, um, my mind is like Microsoft Word, or my mind is like PowerPoint. My mind is the software. And then my experiences are like the person typing into my software. So the content of my knowledge comes through my senses, but the organization of my knowledge, Kant said, comes through reason. This makes perfectly sense, make, perfectly makes sense to me. But of course, Kant then went to the next step and he said, well, you see, we cannot therefore know the world as it is in itself. Das Ding an sich. We cannot know das Ding an sich. We cannot know the world as it is in itself. We can only know the world as it is organized by our minds. We can only know the world as it appears to us. And of course, Kant believed in God. Um, and so he thought, God's not going to make us lie. God's not going to make mind software that, that needs to be debugged or has viruses in it. Um, and of course, um, on, there we might take uh, issue with, with Kant because of the fall and so forth. But um, so Kant believed that, yeah, we can trust our senses um, in that sense. Ha. But, um, but I think this leads us down a path that leads us to today, where basically we are not sure that the world is as we experience it. And we realize we're all stuck in our own head. And we all realize that, that we have a perspective on the world that we can't completely escape. But Kant believed that God didn't lie. Here are some of the features of, of our software, mind software, according to Kant. Although, again, he didn't use the word software. Time and space. So our, our placing of, of objects into space and our, our placing of sequence into time, he says that's a framework that, that God implanted into our mind, uh, uh, the hollow deck in which we put the things around us. Cause effect software. He says, guess what, Hume? Um, I don't need experience to glue uh, these things together because God put cause effect software in my brain. Moral reasoning, um, this fact value thing, the, the gluing of you shouldn't punch me to it hurt when you punched me. That kind of moral re reasoning Kant believes is part of my software. Now, um, if you've watched my video on ethics and duties, you know that I, I although I'm, I'm very, I, I regard Kant highly when it comes to epistem epistemology. I regard Kant crazy when it comes to ethics. So Kant was an absolutist. He had this categorical imperative idea that if something's wrong, it's always wrong, no exceptions. Um, uh, on that one, I, I don't go with him. But the existence of a soul, he would say, this idea of our eternality uh, is part of our, our mind software. And of course, he believed that the existence of God uh, was something that was uh, came on our hard drive uh, when we we are born. Okay, so there's a little bit about about Kant. He also believed uh, that we have a kind of free will to obey the moral law. It's a it's kind of an interesting thing. We are free if we are uh, obeying the moral law, but but we're not free not to obey uh, the moral law. Very interesting. Okay, I want to end this video. Um, it still may take a few minutes, but I want to end this video by talking about what I call three paradigms of knowledge. I'd actually like to write a book called The Platonic Fallacy. Um, I, I think that might be a book I could write and make a contribution to uh, conversation on these sorts of things. But I wanna end this video by talking about three 
paradigms of knowledge. The first paradigm is the Platonic paradigm. And I'm actually not very fond of it, uh, to be honest, honest. In the Platonic way of thinking, ideas are the main thing. Ideas are the primary reality. And in fact, the, the person who is oriented in a kind of Platonic way would say, if we can just get our ideas straight, then everything out will, else will play out. You know, right thinking leads to right action. And I think this is a, a load of tosh. I think this is, this is crazy. There, have been all ki- there are all kinds of people who, who can recite the Apostles' Creed and can recite maybe even the Nicene Creed. You know, they believe all the right things about God, and they're horrible people. You know, some of the worst atrocities in, in, in recent history have been committed by people who probably uh, could completely agree with Orthodox creed. Um, uh, so I de- and I, I knew a fellow growing up, growing up, man in my, my church, um, he, com- he believed all the right things according to you know, the Wesleyan Church, believed all the right things. And yet he, he, he you know, had a fair, you know, he didn't live the way he believed. There was a complete disconnect between what he believed and the way he lived, and he knew it, but he did it anyway. Eventually, he um, got in a horrible car accident, became paralyzed, and 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 repented of all those those things. But what, but what I'm getting at is, there is a complete potential disconnect between thought and action. And in fact, I would, I, would, I would suggest with Jonathan Haidt that more often than not, it goes the other way around. That our, our, the, the, the herd we belong to, the tribe we belong to, the groups we belong to, and what we want to be true in our gut filters into our head. And, and our ideas are, are a manifestation of our, our emotions more than that our mind somehow is in control. I, I, I just think that's, it's just not the way things are uh, most of the time. Uh, there have been plenty of, of brilliant people, for example, um, uh, brilliant philosophers, you know, who were Nazis, you know, uh, for, for example. Of course, I would say their ideas weren't straight, but they could sure talk about logic. These were, I mean, one of the greatest logicians, uh, not magicians, but one of the greatest logicians of the of the early 20th century was very sympathetic to Hitler, um, and you you have to wonder. And I know some very smart people um, who, uh, in my mind, are are completely tone deaf uh, in terms of morality, um, and they don't think that. Um, and so I completely reject the idea that um, the ideas are the primary are the primary thing. Yes, ideas do have consequences. Ideas definitely have consequences. There's a book by that by that title. But for most people, for the vast majority of people, our ideas are what I might call epiphenomenon. They are they are simply a a, a uh, ideological manifestation or abstraction of the way we want to live and the way we want to behave and the, what we want to do. We find a way to justify whatever. Now, again, uh, forgive me, uh, especially. Uh, those of you who are watching this, you know, who, who knows, maybe years from now. Let me give an, an illustration. So in the 2016 election, um, and, and I, I, this is a controversial issue, but in the 2016 election, or before the 2016 election, uh, in I think it was February, uh, Antony uh, uh, Scalia, uh, one of the um, uh, Supreme Court judges died. And um, President Obama, who's a Democrat, um, wanted to appoint a Supreme Court justice uh, to replace him. Well, um, Mitch McConnell, who was the head of the Senate, and a lot of Republicans said, no, 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 uh, it's an election year. The right thing to do is to wait until the election. And if the American people uh, want, a, uh, want a Democrat to appoint um, a Supreme Court justice, they'll vote a Democrat in. But if they vote a Republican in, then they want a Republican pick the Supreme Court justice. And of course, you know, President Trump was elected and he picked a Supreme Court justice. Now, uh, here we are. It's late September, 2020. Uh, The election is in about 40 some days and Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies. And so the, 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 the very same people who four years ago said, no, 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 the election is nine, 10 months off. We should wait and let the election 
decide who gets to pick who the next um, uh, Supreme Court justice is. But now here we are less than two months away from the election and the very same people are saying, well, we need to do our constitutional duty and appoint um, a Supreme Court justice. Now, they're very clever, very clever. In fact, um, the, the, uh, the spin I've heard is, well, when the opposing party's in power. And so in 2016, the opposing party was in power, but in this, in this election, the party of in power is also has the presidency, so that's different. I, I think that's hogwash myself. Now, again, I mean, it, it, you know, uh, as in um, the Pirates of the Caribbean, where um, Jack Sparrow hits um, the guy he's fighting with, and the guy says, you cheated. And he says, I'm a pirate, <laughs> in so many words. So, you know, they can do it, and they will do it. I'm sure they'll do it, um, and appoint a, a, re a replacement. I'm not, I'm not so much... I'm not wanting to cry foul. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is not to cry foul. My purpose is to say that we invent reasons to do what we want to do. In 2016, they needed a, a reason to not appoint a Supreme Court judge. Uh, and so they came up with a reason. And now when they need to appoint a, or want to appoint a Supreme Court judge, they've come up with a reason to appoint a Supreme Court, Court judge. And I'm arguing that this is the way humanity works, that far from being people of, of reason, far from being rational animals, we are irrational animals. We come up with all these arguments most of the time simply to justify what we want to do. And it's all a game, you know, well, I find, let me, I logically, blah, 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 but, but most of the time, I mean, there are the people, the rare people who actually, and I hope I'm a little bit one of these people. I mean, I try to be one of these people, people who really try to see both sides and call a spade a spade. Um, and, and there are people like that, but there are not many of them, not amongst humanity in, in general. Most people, um, they, their ideas are a reflection of their herd and of what they want uh, to be the case. Well, okay. So um, our ideas in this scenario come from revelation and from our uh, presuppositions. Now, I do believe that presuppositions shape uh, our ways of thinking, um, and I do believe in, in revelation. However, um, there is a, I think sometimes these can be excuses uh, within the Platonic uh, paradigm, uh, where you basically say, well, um, God revealed it to me, and therefore you can't question it. You know, I'm wearing glasses, you can't punch me. So I had a revelation uh, that you have to vote for X, and therefore you can't question me because I had a revelation. Um, there's, not, there's not as much um, evidentiary thinking in this kind of Platonic paradigm. It's not, well, let's, let's explore the evidence and see where it leads. It's more like, I got a feeling from God that this is what I'm supposed to do. And of course, presuppositions um, uh, can be big and presuppositions can be small. Uh, a lot of times, uh, those with a kind of Platonic paradigm will talk about worldviews and say, well, this is the worldview. And if you hold this worldview, then you have to hold to all of these presuppositions. And um, so let me give an example uh, here. Uh, so uh, Black Lives Matter uh, started as basically um, when some black individuals were killed by police uh, and video came out and it was fairly clear, at least it seemed clear that this was not right and that um, somebody died unnecessarily um, because um, the, the police in question did not stop, um, you know, chokehold or, or, or whatever. Um, and so um, there was a movement, Black Lives Matter, you know, a couple of years ago, actually. And um, eventually, uh, there was, uh, where there were some people who incorporated the name Black Lives Matter, and there was an organization, Black Lives Matter. And this organization um, uh, certainly engages what's called critical race theory, and it has some probably Marxist, neo-Marxist leanings. Um, and so, um, in my circles, what, what quickly happened is whenever someone was 
would raise the question of, we need to make sure that Black Lives Matter, there was this diversionary tactic. Oh, you shouldn't say that because the group Black Lives Matter is Marxist um, and, and believes in critical race theory. And, and the, let me just, the train of thought was, and that is a worldview. And if you associate with any part of that worldview, you're associating with that whole worldview, which is not the biblical worldview, and therefore you should not say Black Lives Matter. Now, in my mind, this is another example of how um, this is just coming up with an excuse uh, not to work toward racial reconciliation. That that it is, it all sounds very intellectual. Critical race theory, neo-Marxism, you know, and there are videos you can watch on YouTube and 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 there are speakers that you can hear and, and blog posts that you can read, you know. But in my mind, it's all smoke. It's all smoke from people who don't want to engage in racial reconciliation. That that when you take all of the intellectual all of the all of the talk 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 about ideas 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 it ultimately goes down to hearts that aren't interested in 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 advancing uh, equity and justice in society and where where it comes into this question of presuppositions is that it's it's not like every everything in marxism or everything in critical race theory is unique to critical race theory or unique to Marxism. Um, the way I've explained it in some blog comments is there's hydrogen in both water, H2O, and sulfuric acid, H2SO4. There's hydrogen in both, but I will drink water, just did. You saw me, I did it on video, I drank some water. I will not be intentionally drinking sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Um, so you can have the same elements in two different, things and it be bad in the one and good in the other and so again it just blows my mind that someone would say oh that particular thought is also a thought in critical race theory and therefore you can't think it chances are there are some true elements in almost any philosophy you, you know what i mean there's going to be some atoms that are legitimate in it. I mean, it just, it just, it blows my mind. This, 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 this level of simplistic thinking. And in, in fact, who's to say that there's just one critical race theory or who's to say that there's just one form of Marx? I mean, ah, the, 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 okay, I'm moving on. Okay, so Platonic thinking. Now, Christianity of this sort tends to be very oriented around the head. Um, so I know a college where I'm sure they have ethical expectations. It is a good college. But really, um, their historic focus is on what you believe. And so if you're going to, to teach at that college, you have to become part of the church of that college, and you have to believe all of the beliefs of that, that college. And, and, and it's a very head-oriented college um, and a very respectable academic institution. But, um, uh, and, and uh, you may have heard of Jamie Smith, uh, you are what you love, and he's written some other things, um, but he basically talks about um, um, that really it's more a matter of our, our gut, as it were, um, uh, and, and not what we think. Um, I would say that the priorities of the Christian priorities of, of identity are our, our heart orientation, our, our heart dispositions, and then the actions that come from them, and then last of all in priority are the thoughts that we use uh, to integrate with our heart and our, our actions. So um, these sorts of Platonic oriented academics focus on worldviews. I've already talked about all that. So the Platonic paradigm, you can tell that I'm, I'm a little frustrated with it. It tends to, um, it tends to see the things that are actually abstractions as where the reality is. Remember Plato's pointing up. To ideas. Aristotle, the, so number two, perspective number two, the Aristotelian paradigm. Now, the Aristotelian paradigm is what I might call a scientific paradigm. And in this paradigm, I, we, we infer ideas from our observation. So this is a data-driven uh, paradigm, a focus on the empirical and on what we can observe. Um, there might be in this paradigm a focus on natural revelation or what we can know about God from the book of nature, so to speak. See 
the first part of Psalm, Psalm 19. The first part of Psalm 19 is natural revelation. And then the second part of Psalm 19 is what we might call special uh, revelation. So there are some Christians, you may know Josh McDowell, uh, who wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He thinks that Christian thinking is perfectly logical and that anybody with half a brain would know that Christianity was right. Um, C.S. Lewis uh, tended to argue for um, uh, Christ, the truth of Christianity. Um, and of course, the, in, by argument, um, these are the apologists, uh, those who, um, who, who, who go around showing atheists how stupid they are. Um, there, there are some nice apologists, but sometimes you get the impression that like, um, uh, uh, oh, the gentleman that died not too long ago of Indian uh, background, uh, maybe it'll come to me in a second, uh, but uh, uh, Raf, Ra, Ravi Zacharias, you know, he was a nice apologist. There are some apologists who maybe aren't as, as nice. Um, an apologist is somebody who defends Christianity by logical argument. Um, so these, are, these tend to be more Aristotelian-oriented uh, kinds of Christian thinkers. Their, their conclusions may still be ideological, uh, but they arrive at it from the direction of, uh, of evidence. So I would call that the Aristotelian paradigm. The third paradigm I'm going to call the pragmatist uh, paradigm. And I lean strongly in this direction. Now, I do believe that we can, I, I do believe that, that we can identify universals. Um, so I'm not entirely, uh, I suppose, a nominal, nominalist would be the, the medieval uh, name for this, this school, I think. So I, I'm not entirely in this camp. But I do think that the best way to arrive at universals is to build up from uh, particulars. Um, so I'm a little I'm a little Aristotelian and a lot pragmatist. So I would say that ideas are, for the most part, our way of talking about the world. They don't have, I don't think, a, a reality independent of the world. Now, math is another question. Is math? But I, I tend to view math as an abstraction of the world. However, um, even and so our ideas are are tools that we use. They're not real. They are tools that help us get at uh, the reality of the world. And so we typically group things by family resemblances, not because this goes here and this goes here and this goes here. It's kind of like I was saying, there could be hydrogen in more than one, one molecule. And so when you look at my family, there are certain characteristics you know, that my family have. Um, you know, um, some of us like to talk a lot. Um, some of us um, are uh, rather fond of bread um, and have round bellies. Um, you know, some of us have big noses. I, I'm developing the jowls. No, not the jowls. You know, so there. Not everybody has. You know, my my mother's family. I think there's something going on. I think with their ears. But any anyway. So not everybody in the family has a core set of characteristics. Um, rather, some people have one, some people have another, but you can kind of tell, hey, you're, you're a shank, aren't you? Um, and so um, that is actually a much more uh, likely way of grouping things than essences, the way that um, Plato Platonists and even Ar Ar Aristotelians tend to group things by kinds this is this kind, this is this kind, this is this kind, and by essences. And I think that that's not one, not, ac not as accurate uh, as this more family resemblance approach. Um, but also, um, it can lead to oppression, because if you don't fit the essence, then you're in trouble. Um, I, have, I have trouble with those who consider maleness or femaleness um, to, to have really clear essential properties. Now, I do think that there probably are um, some essential properties in terms of, of sex, uh, in terms of the female sex, you know what I mean? There are physical characteristics that you could point to. But when we're talking about gender, uh, things like um, what, what is feminine or what is masculine, um, I tend to, to think that those don't have clear essences. There may be girls that want to play with trucks, there may be boys that want to play with dolls, and that's fine. They're, they're no less of a boy um, because of it. These are social constructs uh, of gender, I, I would say. And so uh, I, have, I have serious uh, problems with 
the attempt to essentialize uh, gender in, in that kind of that kind of way. Um, and so, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and, and maybe maybe um, be a little condescending here and say that I think that it's you're not quite as as uh, in aware. I don't know what smart's not the right word, but 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 there is a a, a whole higher level of understanding when you perceive the world this way. And now maybe I'm maybe I'm self deceived, but I often I often perceive myself to have a a more um, a higher level of understanding of the way things are working uh, because I don't pigeonhole uh, things into particular boxes and categories in the way that a Platonist or Aristotelian might. Um, so most of the lines we draw about the world are more human made than built into the world. It is it is very interesting to hear people talk about um, national borders as if there's actually a line there. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, there's, there's, there's nothing really there. Uh, sometimes there's a river. I mean, I mean, okay, some of these things did correspond to um, physical boundaries and, and so forth, but, but it's just, it's an imaginary line, really. When somebody steps over it, now, we have come to believe that somebody stepping over that imaginary line is very serious. But there's no reason why it would be as serious to the person necessarily doing it. You, you know what I mean? This is part of that unitary thinking where we don't even realize the other way of, of thinking or, or binary thinking. Well, they're, they're, they're evil if they stepped across that line. Well, let's say that you're in your yard um, and uh, let's say you've just bought a house and there's no fence up. But let's say that you don't know this, but your neighbor is very particular about the property line and your neighbor knows where that property line is and let's say that you innocently kind of walk over in that direction and you step a few you know yards into what is really his yard and he comes screaming out maybe comes with a shotgun what are you doing in my yard i mean you see, see what i'm saying the line isn't there now the line is drawn there by our minds and and this is where the saying that perception is a kind of reality uh it is and perception actually uh, can can be more real than real reality uh, sometimes because people behave in according to what they per perceive. And so a lot of the lines that we draw around the world aren't really there. They're drawn there uh, by human minds. And I would say that that uh, the pragmatist would say that the end is more important than the means. Um, now, I'm not saying that the end justifies the means in terms of murdering people. That's a whole different uh, thing. But I think in the overwhelming majority of times, the end is really what's important. The means is not. Um, many, many times, maybe even most of the time, um, uh, there, there are many ways to get to Buffalo from where I'm at. I'm in Houghton, New York, as I make this video. There, there's more than one way to get to Buffalo. Um, now, uh, the important thing is that I get to Buffalo for whatever I want to get there in time. Um, in, in a way, it, you know, it doesn't matter whether I go one way or the, the other, not, not in terms of the vast end of the universe. Um, so in most times in life, the goal is more important than the means. Now, I, now here I have to realize that there are people from other cultural backgrounds who would say, Ken, it's all about the journey. Um, this is typical white uh, Western thinking that you're talking about here. Well, maybe so. But I believe that my video is at an end. So you'll have to write in the comments on YouTube about all of my blind spots where I'm a pre-reflective thinker. And I want to be reflective, so please lambast me. I hope you've enjoyed this video.